Well, good afternoon, everybody. I think it's now two o'clock. Uh, my name is Nick Chavas, and uh, I'm going to give a talk entitled Navigation Blunders, Lockdown Pursuits and New Plans. But while people join, yes, we have a few. We have a few uh, who are coming up to say that they're listening. Um, but while people join, um, you probably know that uh, I am the author of Atlantic France Edition 2, which was published in May 2018. A funny little story about selling the book. It actually didn't manage to make it to the bookstalls until about mid or late June. And the family, we were on our way to Ireland in our boat and got as far as the Scilly Isles. And uh, we were anchored quite happily uh, in St Agnes. And we rowed ashore and met another couple who had also rowed ashore. We were going up to the Turk's Head, St Agnes, Britain's most southerly alehouse. Anyway, on stepping ashore onto the beach, I asked the person and said, well, where are you going tomorrow? He said, well, I'm off to, uh, to France, to southern Brittany. And um, I then said, um, well, I hope you've got a decent pilot book with you. And his wife exclaimed, don't talk to him about pilot books. He's got so many on board, I can't move. And then he said, well, actually, there's been a new one that's just come out about Southern Brittany, and I cannot find it anywhere, can't get it. And I left Chichester, and I've been into every chandlery on my way to the Celia Isles to try and find this new edition of Atlantic France. I said, oh, really? Carrying on a little bit. And he said, yes, look, on the phone here, I've got the ISBN number, and I've got a picture of the, the actual book itself. And after a bit, I said to him, well, do you know something? You're looking at the author of that book, and as it happens, I've got a box of 10 of them on board. And this evening, if you like, I'll row over with a signed copy and give it to you. And he nearly fell over on the beach. He couldn't believe that the day before he was setting off uh, to Labarack and to go around to Southern Brittany that he'd got a copy of this book. So anyway, that made me feel quite happy that there were people actually out there wanting to purchase um, a copy of Atlantic France. Now, there are a lot of people who are saying hello, which is great. Um, I won't at the moment look into look for any questions, um, but I'm going to set off uh, on about a 30 minute something like that um, talk. And uh, I will take questions um, as we go. So um, for those who have just joined, my name is Nick Chavas. I'm the author of Atlantic France, and, and I've been asked by Lucy Wilson of IMRE um, to host the third in a series of live uh, IMRE live events. Uh, Lucy explained that it might be a kind of book club, yacht club, bar event space during lockdown. Well, as you know, I follow the celebrities, Rod and Lou Heichel, authors of many of the pilot books in the Mediterranean, and Tom Cunliffe, world-renowned author, journalist and broadcaster. <coughs> so not much. Uh, to live up to there. So what about me? Um, in 2014, whilst on a meet, a meet in Brittany, Jeremy Parkinson asked me if I might be interested in taking over as author of Atlantic France. It fits, the book itself, Atlantic France, fits into a range of pilot books. Uh, the authors in the main provided by the Royal Cruising Club Foundation. Uh, and you can see their 2020 catalogue here, if I hold it up to the camera. So I hope that people can see that. And Atlantic France is in the middle there um, as an example of the range of books that they do. The book itself um, is Atlantic France. I can't actually see whether you can see it, but I hope everybody can see it. And that's the front cover of the book. That's it. Yes, got it there. Um, very happily, it's got a, um, a picture of Wild Bird um, coming out of Suzon on Belle Isle um, on the front cover of the book. Unlike uh, Rod and Lou Heichel, who displayed in-depth knowledge about cooking at sea, uh, I know nothing about cooking either at sea or on dry land. And Tom Cunliffe, <laughs> a massively good storyteller, author of untold books and videos, uh, I'm new to the game of writing books. Pilot books 
however, are not like Jilly Cooper novels, page turners, where you don't expect to get feedback. With pilot books, we invite people to tell us where we get it wrong, a form of masochism. But joking aside, we do welcome feedback so that the information may be updated for the benefit of future yachtsmen. Uh, I want to touch for a few minutes on the relevance of a pilot book in the digital age. Uh, at the outset, I own up to the fact that I love newspapers, books, charts and maps, but I also enjoy technology, understanding how it works and how to make the best of it. The hours that I've spent trying to evaluate the various methods of communicating at sea are legendary. Fathoming out the differences in reliability and effectiveness between Wi-Fi and mobile data with 3, 4, 5G data, the advent of the internet cafe and the pros and cons of Iridium versus SSB when at sea on passage. I often laugh at the marinas in France and I've been to a great deal of marinas in France, which when you go and pay your large, normally large amount of money, particularly in high summer, they they say with a little smile and free Wi-Fi available throughout. I always giggle and laugh at that and then try it. And then when I ask them later on, they say, well, yes, it normally works. But in high summer, there's too little bandwidth for the number of people. And in one case, one harbour master was uh, humble enough to admit that the Wi-Fi mast had blown away last winter in the storms and hadn't yet been replaced. In the same light, uh, I believe that there's a place for a chart or map and uh, for a, a chart map and a pilot book, as well as the digital op options. In the same way that sales of Kindle have not developed as much as people thought they would, book sales are still buoyant. And I imagine that's the case. They've probably gone up in the current lockdown scenario. The pilot book isn't a one-off publication. In fact, it's edited from previous editions. The old saying that rocks don't move is true, but the difference between the old Royal Navy Admiralty pilot is that it was designed for professional seamen and not leisure yachtsmen who generally have different agendas. They want to know a bit about pilotage, where to park, what the facilities are like, and I don't mean the cleanliness of the loos, and where to go and what to do ashore. Some history or geographical facts and maybe the author's personal, ex personal experiences are also popular. The first pilot book was part of a set of books called Sailing Tours, which I'm holding up here. And Sailing Tours was written by Frank Cowper. And in my area, it went extended from Falmouth to the Loire. It was published in 1894. The current range of pilot books have developed from those written by Adelard Coles and others in the 1960s. In my area, in the second edition, we've extended the area covered to include Ushant and the islands down as far as the Spanish border, a distance of over 400 miles. And so today on offer from Imre, we have the book at retail price of £42.50. We have a digital option at £27, which comes in the form of an ebook based on PDFs. There are formal supplements to the pilot books available on the MRE and the RCC Pilotage Foundation website, where you can also find current notices and updates displayed on a world map. I've visited 100 ports from Labarac to Bordeaux and more than more than the 100 anchorages in our Bowman 40 Wildbird uh, in the summer of 2016. And in France, it's, it's people often forget, but there are 12 main inhabited islands down the west coast on the Atlantic coast, and about 40 additional islands inside the Gulf of the Morbihan, and 19 navigable rivers. And navigable, by that I mean it's navigable, navigable by Wildbird, a 40 foot yacht with a 1.5 meter draft. In doing this, um, which took me about 18 or 20 weeks uh, in 2016, uh, I learned a lot of lessons about myself 
about life, about sailing and about navigation. <clears throat> the first lesson I want to share with you concerns the Nividic overfalls at the western end of the island of Ushant near Lampool. So I'd been with my eldest daughter quite happily in Abril Du, and she decided to cycle off back to Roscoff to get on the ferry to go home. And this was the first of many times where I was on my own piloting, navigating the yacht, the Bowman 40 on my own, and decided that I should be that the weather was good enough to go out to Ashant. So I set off in a westerly direction to the Bay du Stiff um, and spent lunch tied to a buoy, which uh, some of you have had a bad experience because they're not maintained, which I didn't know about at the time. I uh, had a lunch there at the Bay du Stiff and then decided unusually to go around the northern side of Ushant. Now, um, the overfalls um, are really a combination of wind, tide and depth. And I was sailing solo along the northern coast of Ushant, wind on the beam with the Yankee out doing five knots in a force four with blue skies. But at the west end of Ushant, there were look, what looked to me to be some benign overfalls, how wrong I was. As I started to motor sail into these overfalls, my speed over the ground dropped from five knots to four knots to three knots to two knots to zero. And at zero, I then decided I could either try and go north out or in towards into the Atlantic or south, but dangerously close to the rocks and lighthouses. Now, the Navidic lighthouse, in fact, used to be supplied with two pylons and they're very impressive. They're like other lighthouses, but they had a wire going from the mainland to two specific towers and then eventually to the lighthouse it, it itself. And in rough, rough weather, when they couldn't get a boat to the lighthouse, that's how they used to resupply the lighthouse via these pylon lines between the towers to the lighthouse. Anyway, after a bit of time, uh, I actually felt quite pleased with myself. I suddenly realized on, on the speed over the ground instrument that I was recording 1.5 knots. So I thought, oh, this is good. I'm actually gonna make some headway. What I hadn't realized or dawned on me a bit later was that actually I was going 1.5 knots backwards. And so there it took a long struggle to get round these spring tides before they weakened. And I actually ended up getting in, squeezing in past the rocks and into Lampool, which is a delightful anchorage. And I recommend that you can look at if you haven't done it. So the next um, lesson that I learned concerns tides. And in, in France, it's to do with the coefficients. Now, if you're holidaying in the Med, as many people do, the tides are notoriously about one foot. In Gibraltar, where the Atlantic meets the Mediterranean, they're about one meter. On the west coast of France, they average about nine meters. In Canada, they can range as much as 15 meters. So you can see that the challenges of sailing and cruising and chartering yachts and so on in France are pretty exciting and they add to uh, the other challenges thrown at you. Now the coefficients basically used quite a lot by the French. It gives an indication of the magnitude of the tide on any specific day. In other words, how much of a spring or how much of a neap tide. And typical values are that 120 is a very big spring tide, 70 is about an average tide, and 20 is a very small neap tide. And they're often used by harbours at what's to, to describe at what state of the tide access over a sill uh, is possible. The higher the coefficient, the larger the window to get in and out of the port across the sill. However, don't worry, most of the harbours these days, um, the harbour masters are kind enough to actually display a board uh, on the, at the entrance or exit point of the harbour displaying the height of the water above the sill. 
So if you go gently nudging towards it, keep your eyes open for the board. Most of them have boards now so that you can actually see and work out whether or not it's safe to cross. So this year, um, there are probably questions. I just can see. Yeah, there are lots of questions coming in. I'll take a quick question now at a gap. Just brought you on because I was planning something. Paul Edie here. Thank you very much. I've just bought your book because I was planning and still hoping to sail to La Rochelle this summer. Perfect. Greetings from the Netherlands. I hope we can sail this summer. Great initiative. Hi, Nick. Thank you. Jane, Paul, Hilary, Victoria, Stefan. OK, do start bringing in any questions um, as they appear. So for this year in 2020, um, as we're along with the rest of us, our, our sailing plans have been scuppered. We were a plan planning to attend the celebrations to mark Ostar 60, which was the 60th anniversary of single-handed transatlantic race. And apart from the usual round of parties, we were all set to see the start and wave off the boats as they left Plymouth Sound. We were then also going to join in the fun with Mayflower 400. And Mayflower 400 um, was celebrating the anniversary, 400 years, in 1620, of the pilgrims setting off in Mayflower from Plymouth to America. The passengers later became known as pilgrims and influenced the future of the USA. And it's interesting to note that the method of determining longitude did not start to become available until 1775 or about 1775 with the revelation of John Harrison's clocks nearly 150 years later. After that, we were planning to go to Cork and mark the 300th anniversary, lots of centenaries and anniversaries happening this year, of the founding of the oldest yacht club in the world. It had hoped to have had, that we would have had a posh dinner, black tie dinner in Cork City Hall for a thousand people, and a massive parade of sail involving several yacht clubs, including the Cruising Club of America. We were then gonna make the opportunity to go up the west coast of Ireland uh, and over winter in the Clyde this coming winter before moving onwards up around the top and into the Baltic possibly in future years. However, about two or three months ago, uh, the Pilotage Foundation and IMRE have asked me to do a, a new edition of Atlantic France with a view to it being published in late 22, early 23. So this means that our plans have changed and instead of going north, if we ever get out of this um, lockdown, we're gonna start heading south at the end of uh, the start of next season. Wild Bird, our boat is currently in Wareham at Ridge Wharf, a shore with a very nice view on the upper reaches of Pool Harbor, sitting next to a large 50 ton yellow crane which has gone on strike due to the lockdown. So what have I been doing with lockdown? And what have my pursuits been? So I've been asked to write an article about my area, the Atlantic France area, for Yachting Monthly and IMRE based on the Morbihan. And the subject matter concerns what happens if you charter a yacht. And it's entitled A Week Afloat, it's designed to cater for crew wishing to charter somewhere abroad and there are going to be 13 monthly articles and the one on Morbi on my one is going to be out in the August edition of Yachting Monthly. It will also be a, a, available as a pocket pilot PDF from Imre or Google Play Books on completion and this is an assistance or a way forward using digital uh, giving people bite-sized chunks um, to be able to use if they go chartering yachts for a week. The actual article itself is based on the fact that you could charter a boat from La Trinité, which is just outside the Morbihan, a fascinating inland sea of about 50 square miles and 40 islands, and also the island of Huat. And Huat is one of three islands just outside the Quiberon Peninsula, Belle-Ile, Herdic and Huat. Quite interesting if you go into the Quiberon Bay, which is the most beautiful bay, and just east of 
just to the east of the bay, you'll see the entrance to the Morbihan. But this was the scene um, in Quiberon Bay in 1759, when Admiral Sir Edward Hawke led the Royal Navy fleet against the French and won. Many ships were lost, and this action was actually during the Seven Years' War. And it was the final straw for the French and eliminated any threat of an invasion, any invasion of England. And when you go there, it's very fast, it's fascinating to see, and you can work out in the bad weather how those ships were lost uh, on the shore. I've also been training my six month old black cocker spaniel, and that's been quite a challenge. I've also made the opportunity of cataloguing photographs. I've had about 5,000 photographs, and I should think I won't be alone if, you were, if I asked you to own up. Um, the, the photographs, for me, it's crucial to make sure that I make the best use of, of producing edition three of Atlantic France to try and make sure that I've got the best photographs for the publication. I also, um, last time I, I did it in 2016, uh, being new to the game, thought that the best way was to go and purchase a DSLR camera. So I went along to John Lewis and spent 500 pounds on one of those very ni nice but large and slightly clumsy cameras and got very irritated when I kept being shown photographs of people that they'd taken using an iPhone. So I have invested in one of the newer iPhones and also invested in a camera course. And so I'm learning um, day by day on a very useful iPhone camera course. It costs a hundred pounds and actually uh, I've been finding it very good and I hope that my photographs in the next edition will be as best as it, it is possible to take. So moving on now to jobs that are being done on the boat in the winter. Um, one of the things which I, I've thought about is we've had our, our yacht for about seven years and I've often wondered what the inside of the fuel tank was like. I mentioned this to somebody the other day. He said he'd rather not think about it. Um, but I did this and I thought, well, having had the thought, I really ought to do something about it. Because if we're going to go long distance at the end of next year, then that is something I would like to be able to sleep at night to know that there isn't great a, a certain amount of sludge, which is likely to uh, cause a problem for the engine. Well, interestingly, uh, the drain was completely blocked. Uh, quite a dangerous exercise to try and remove that drain, particularly if the tank is full of diesel at the time, so be careful. So we had to drain all the diesel out, and then in the end, it proved to be well worth doing because the amount of gunge and sediment in the bottom of the tank was quite considerable. So on now to the big one, or should I just take a couple of questions? I'm looking at some questions now coming in here. And here's one here. Um, the areas of Atlantic uh, areas of Atlantic France for recent day skippers. Yes, um, um, I've been asked here about the areas of Atlantic for recent day skippers. Well, I I would seriously recommend the Morbihan uh, as being an excellent area because you can stay, you can do Belle Isle, Herdic, and Huat. You can then do inside the Quiberon Peninsula, La Trinité, and Port Halligan. And you can also uh, spend many days inside the Gulf of the Morbihan exploring the islands. You have to be a little bit careful and a little bit adventurous with the tides, the strength of the tides in the Morbihan, but that would be ideal. Um, another area could be Benade, Concarneau and Ile de Glenon. That's a wonderful area. Or also, if you go down to La Rochelle, uh, there's plenty of scope um, around the area in the bay leading into La Rochelle um, with Ile de Ray, Ile de Saint-Martin. Okay, I've got a number of questions on the screen here. Um, do I take crew with me? Um, <laughs> when I was doing the book, uh, I managed to recruit a lot of family and friends who came out. It was a period of 17 or 18 weeks. Some of the occasions I was on my own, but uh, most of the time I had one or two people with me. Um, my wife. 
Jeez. <laughs> right, working from the boat, I need good Wi-Fi. Can you say two or three places that were good on the Atlantic coast, please? Well, if you heard my earlier comments about Wi-Fi, uh, Wi-Fi can be a little bit of a joke. Uh, good places, the closest you can get to a router, I, in the harbour master, which they call the capitanery, the better. So if it means going sitting behind his desk, that's the, the best place. From there, you take port luck. If you go down into the marina, the further you go from the mast, the weaker it gets. The more people that are using it in terms of bandwidth, the weaker it gets. And the old adage of actually, well, walk off the boat and go to an internet cafe. It'll cost you a cup of espresso or Americano or a beer. Um, then that's normally you can save yourself a lot of hassle and effort and worry if you do that. Um, what's the best time of year from Hillary um, to cruise this particular coast? If you go any time really between May and September is good. The only thing I would be a little bit careful of is you have to juggle with French summer holidays. So they hike the prices up quite a lot in late July, the second two weeks of July and August, but not extent, not extortionately, but you also have to deal with the crowds. Um, another one here, the best places for crew changes. So this is Paul Edel, I think, um, the best places for crew changes. Um, down the west coast, um, if we take it from the top, uh, it depends on how the crew are coming in. If they're coming in by ferry, then they will arrive normally at St. Malo or Roscoff and then make their way by train or bus. I thoroughly recommend a website when uh, trying to plan crew changes called Rome to Rio. It is Rome and then the figure two and then Rio. And if you go onto that website, it's got nothing to do with Rome and nothing to do with Rio, but it will give you all the different options about how to get from A to B. And it can include from your home in UK to wherever the boat may be uh, in France. Other places, if you're coming in by air, you're likely to come in to Brest or Nantes or Rennes or La Rochelle, and from there get trains or buses. In Brittany, in particular, in the summer months, uh, they are very reasonably priced and you can normally travel on one single bus from one end of its route to the other for two euros. So if you're crossing, say, from Roscoff to Concarneau, you could get there. I think it's for four euros because you have to make one change. Other places to change are Brest, um, Lorient, uh, La Rochelle, um, and there are a number of others, but I would need to I will need to look. OK, I'm just going to continue now with my script or my talk um, just before I take the further questions. OK, so the other thing that's been concerning us over the winter months on the boat uh, is the big one, particularly in terms of expense. Uh, I've decided after seven years of putting up with my in-mast furling to change to conventional slab reefing. I've tried to make the in-mast furling work. I've renewed the mainsail. I've got the an engineer mechanic to renew the ball bearings and, and so on within the mast itself to make the furler itself more free up. Uh, we've changed the standing rigging, not that that was specifically to, related to the in-mast furling, but that's been changed. And whatever happens, in my case, I do not feel 100% comfortable within mast furling. And I wish to be able to sleep at night and know that it will, the mainsail will come down when I want it to. When I started researching this on the forums, people suggested, why on earth would you want to buy a petrol engine car and then replace the petrol engine with a diesel? Well, I can see where he's coming from, particularly when you look at the cost. However, um, boats uh, are about love, are about classics, about style, um, about comfortability, of being comfortable and 
I just feel that I would feel a lot happier with conventional slab reefing. And so the sail is on order, the mast is on order, but we're all in lockdown, so nothing's going to happen until life frees up. So I'm coming to the end of the main bid, Atlantic France edition three. The future of pilot books uh, and the chart plotter. Um, the, the, the future of pilot books, I, I really don't think the pilot book is dead. It's alive and kicking and it will complement the chart plotter. The chart plotter, whether it's now on the binnacle or down in the cockpit, of course becomes more user friendly by the day. And particularly now that you can overlay the radar and AIS onto it. And no doubt in future you'll be able to access bits of text um, about uh, ports that you might be visiting. But the, the pilot book is the thing that's needed when you're going through um, difficult areas. I was thinking particularly down the um, port salt in a race. When you're in a, a tearing hurry on a spring tide, what you need is a pilot book so that it, you can look at it and read it out sentence by sentence. So I think the future of pilot books is actually quite rosy. Um, I wouldn't go anywhere without one, but it complements the chart plotters as they get better and better. I'm going to do the research for the next edition, edition three in 2021, starting in April next year. We'll be writing it up in 2022 and it'll be published on current plans in either late 22 or early 23. Because we've changed our plans for the Pilotage Foundation in Imray, very sadly, we're going to have to keep going south. So subject to the Brexit rules and the 90 days abroad and all that that is yet to be to be decided exactly how that will work. We will probably go on to Galicia in Spain and maybe across the pond to the Caribbean and the United States in 2023. So that brings me to an end at 32 minutes. I hope you found some of this interesting my thoughts on the future of pilot books, some navigational lessons, boat jobs that I've been looking at this winter and how I've been amusing myself during the lockdown period. I've also touched on the plans for the production of Atlantic France edition of three and some cruising aspirations. After all, dreams are free. Thank you for listening. I'll now look at some of the questions and do my best to answer them. So here we go. Um, Julia Wells, thank you. What would be passage time from La Rochelle to San Sebastian on the north coast of Spain? Well, you're not asking much. However, we set off from Ile de Yer, Port Joinville last summer to get to Corona. Um, and if I remember rightly, I think we were two days and a night. So about, about two days is what you're looking for. Uh, motor sailing. Andrew Wilkes. Hi, Nick. If we can't sail in the summer this year, do you have any views about sailing in the winter? Yes. The younger you are, the better. Um, yeah, I, I think if we can get out in the summer, if, if we can do some sailing in October, November, I mean, in years gone by, and you're, you're quite tough, Andrew, you do a lot of time up in the higher latitudes. Um, it, there's per perfect opportunities and who knows what the climate's got in, hold, in store for us this summer. If it's anything to go by April, we should all have been out there. Anne Chivers, I used your book last year working my way down to La Rochelle. Back up with many ports in between your book is invaluable. Possibly the best pilot book in my collection. Anne Chivers, that's wonderful. Right, another one from Andrew Wilkinson. Which marina, in your experience, has the best worst toilet shaft in Atlantic France? Worst, the dungeon at Port of Elbow and Camaray. <laughs> yes. Um, yes, the best, oh, golly. Uh, the best and the most expensive is probably La Rochelle Port Minim. The worst, yes, the dungeon in Port Vauban. But if you walk for another three or four minutes, uh, they're slightly better, not a lot better, but they're slightly better in, in Camaray on the on the on the key there. Um, can I access it, Julia Wells? Can I access it, access Southern Brittany by inland waterway from Dijon? 
Thank you, Anthony. Um, <laughs> I'm sure you probably can, um, because actually the canals come out at Redon. Check me up on that one, but I'm pretty certain the canal access into the Atlantic comes out at Redon. That's one of the access points. Um, Kayak, Amy, surely 4G is easier than Wi-Fi or isn't coverage good down there? Well, Amy, was it Kayak? Um, the answer depends on where you are. So in terms of Wi-Fi, it's the proximity to the mast and the router. In terms of 2G, 3G, 4G and 5G, it depends on the, on the carrier that you're using. Um, and how far offshore you are. But you've only got to go about 10 miles offshore and, and you won't get anything on, on either of those. So it, ten, it depends where you are and you've got to be able to, you've got to be in a position to try both. Of course, people use Wi-Fi because it's cheaper um, than using up your data on the mobile data. Lee Newman, do you have to take buoys or slips or can you find places to spend the night at anchor? Certainly you can anchor. No, um, in some cases, in some areas, I have used a tripping buoy uh, to protect the anchor in case it gets stuck. Um, but no, the, the beauty of cruising, the big beauty of cruising is that you can anchor almost anywhere. I mean, the place where it's perhaps most interesting is in the Morbihan because the streams run at a high rate of knots up to nine knots in the entrance to the Morbihan. But inside the Morbihan between the islands, the, the average stream rate when it's properly running is about three to four knots. And you just got to be a little bit brave. Um, and there are plenty of places for anchoring. <clears throat> you do not have to pay extortionate marina charges every night. The only reason you might want to go in there is if your crew are desperate for a shower and to go shopping. Um, where are we? Zhao Bento, pilot books are the piece of art and must read for all the encyclopedia of the nautical adventures. Thank you, Joao. Um, Margie Shabas, Camry probably still the worst. That's answering somebody else. Okay. Joe Fraser, great talk, really enjoyed it. Grant, Atlantic and better coverage. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. And, and my question read the end mast furling was the only way to do it a new mast and boom, as opposed to fitting a track. Ah, yes, I researched the possibility of fitting a track, and everybody in the industry, and I, I believe them, I don't, I don't think they were <laughs> trying to trying to sell me a mast necessarily, has said that. When they have done that in the past, it has not been a great success. Not quite sure what the reason is, but retrofitting a track to a mast within mast furling uh, has not proved successful. So I've been told. Um, used Colin Moriarty, used 4G tablet throughout Southern Britain. He always a fair to be very good signal while off the coast. Okay, it just depends on how far off the coast you go, Colin. Uh, good talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Enjoyable. Um, Jane Russell, it's an overnighter between La Rochelle and Bilbao. Yes, but Bilbao is uh, in the bottom right hand corner, the southeast corner of the Biscay. That's that's fine. Uh, Matthew, thank you. Good time. Very interesting. Um, Thomas, they say the waters around Ash and Malen are most difficult in Europe, tides, currents. What's your opinion? They're challenging, Thomas, but they're enormous fun and very rewarding. Um, I wouldn't say they were any worse than on the north coast of Brittany. Uh, there are some places where there are similar issues. It's it certainly Ushant. People are often in a rush to get south of Point Pen Marsh, um, but there's a lot to be said for Russian, and we've had some fantastic evenings in Malen overlooking the harbour there. The most beautiful, beautiful scenery. It's worth worth a look, and I wouldn't get any more worried about it than anywhere else. Um, Guy Warner, yeah, more about the treasure hunt later, Guy. 
Um, Anne Lloyd, thank you. Let's go. Yes, thank you. Uh, we have considerably abandoned less issues on our six year navigation. I mean, not sure what that is. Uh, okay. The Brittany, oh, hang on. More Camilla Herman. The Brittany waterways are very shallow. Okay, with a motorboat max 1.4 meters, possibly less. What's your favorite marina spot in Portugal? Um, Joe, no, I, I'm afraid I deal with France. I haven't been to Portugal in a boat, um, so I'm afraid I can't answer that question, but I know lots of people who might well be able to. Okay. Uh, at 41 minutes, uh, I think it's probably, unless there are any more questions coming in at the last minute. Is there one here or was that I've answered that one? I've answered that one. Um, thank you very much, everybody. I hope you've enjoyed it and it's, it's some light relief from lockdown. <laughs> Goodbye. End. <laughs> <laughs>